reducing remakes by evaluating compressions prior to pouring. My name is Sarah, and I will be facilitating the webinar. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please type them in the right-hand side of your screen in the questions box. We are recording the webinar today, and it will be available online at witmix.com in roughly five to seven days. In addition, we are, um, or I'm sorry, in addition, the webinar has in, been NBC approved for one scientific credit. After the webinar, we will be sending you an email on how to obtain that credit. Now I'd like to introduce to you our speaker today, Craig Pickett. Craig is our technical support manager here at WIPMIC and has over 25 years experience in the dental laboratory industry. Craig is NBC certified in Crown and Bridge with a technologist designation. Craig? Thank you, Sarah. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, the topic this morning is reducing remakes by evaluating impressions prior to pouring. This is the uh, emphasis that we want to uh, talk about today. There's a lot of times that we just go right ahead, we clean up our impressions, we get them all poured up, pull them apart, look at what we have, and realize that it's not sufficient. But at that point, for many of us, uh, that impression has been destroyed, and uh, we don't have the, the means now to really go back and communicate with our doctors very well, other than looking at a hard uh, surface. And uh, that's not always the best. So what we're going to do is talk about what we want to do prior uh, to pouring things up. All right. Um, I like this little, uh, this little slide because for many of us, this is exactly what impressions are, a giant headache. Uh, and, and cause a lot of problems. And so it's important that we take a look at the things that can help us to eliminate some of the problems as we move forward. And we need to catch them right off the bat. All right, so I wanted to show you this. This is called the cycle of insanity. Some of you have seen this before. I'm not exactly sure where it came from, although I know it came out of the dental laboratory industry. Uh, it's been posted on, uh, on boards uh, before. Uh, and I'm not sure who the author is but it makes total sense to me. If you'll travel with me up here to the top where the red uh, arrow is, we're going to move in a clockwise fashion and tell me if this doesn't take place in your own laboratory. Uh, the doctor takes an impression, he looks at it, and he thinks to himself, the lab can fudge that. He already sees that there's a little problem someplace, but he's been working with you for a while and he has a history of the laboratory repairing things. Uh, the next jump down, the lab gets uh, the impression, looks at it and thinks, I can't fudge that. That's something I don't want to mess with. So they call the doctor and they say, I need a new impression. And the doctor says, it's the best I can do. Sometimes they don't even say it's the best I can do. They just say, just go with it, right? Just do it, just do it. So the lab pours that case up and they, they make the corrections as best they possibly can. They fabricate that restoration. They send it back to the doctor's office. Then the important thing here to recognize in the next step here is the doctor attempts to insert that restoration. And of course, it doesn't fit or something else is wrong. He forgets about his first impression uh, that we've already talked about and the call from the lab for a new impression. He takes the new impression, looks at it, and says the lab can fudge that uh, because he has that same little problem, and then writes remake on the case. The lab gets it back and looks at it and says, I just can't fudge that. So they call the doctor, and they say, I need a new impression, doctor. This one's not good enough. Uh, but the doctor's response is often, this is the second time we're doing this case and you can't have a new impression. Like somehow in there, um, the laboratory messed up the first one. And so the lab goes ahead and they fudge it. They remake the case for nothing. They send the, the uh, restoration back to the doctor. And once again, the doctor attempts to insert it. It doesn't fit. And his thought process at that point, or hers, is uh, this lab is killing me. Now, the laboratory hasn't done anything here except try and make it work. But the doctor stops sending work, and then the lab makes the worst uh, mistake of their life. 
they call the doctor up and ask him for another chance. Now, this can go round and round and round and round, and in many laboratories it does, and we need to stop this cycle because it's crazy. Uh, what we need to do is to get good communication skills going. All right, so let's, uh, let's go to the next one. How do we avoid these problems? We start communicating with each other. And this is a great little uh, picture here in the middle of this slide. This is actually not communication. Uh, this is making lots of loud noise and expressing your opinion, but it's not communicating. Uh, we're not getting the information transferred from you, the laboratory, about problems that you foresee to the doctor in a meaningful way that will make him reconsider where the impression is. Uh, and the information that's been captured, and the problems that are going to go forward with this. Uh, and that needs to be noted right up front. All right, so how do we do it? There's a couple of methods of communication. We're open to all kinds of things. Most of us have the, uh, the classic telephone call, which is met usually with uh, the words, just do it. Uh, some of us actually take the time out of the laboratory to drive back over to the office with the impression. And we do a little office consultation, but uh, this was a great photograph. You can kind of see the picture of the doctor here. Um, they are in a bind at that point. Uh, somehow they're going to have to call their patient and say there was a mistake made. And they don't like doing that just as much as we don't like calling doctors and saying there's been a mistake made. So these are the, the most common. Uh, they're out there. They're not exactly the best methods of communication right now. Uh, we've stepped into a new age. We've got electronic communication, digital photography. And if you have not yet availed yourself of these two things, you should. It's very simple to take a very quick, nice photograph. You don't have to spend a whole lot on a camera. Just something that can get up very close. Take the photograph, attach it to an email, send it over to his office, then call his office and let him know that that's waiting there for him to take a look at. Both of you can get on, on uh, the telephone together, and while he's looking at the photograph, you're looking at the real thing, and you can talk about the problems that you're going to run into. It's a great way to communicate. So if you're not doing it, once again, you need to begin. You need to begin. All right, now, the lab team. Uh, we've got the model and die technician, and we have the communicator. And many times, these are not the same person. If you have a model and die manager uh, that can take care of this, then it's great. They're a little closer to the action. If you don't, then you need to have communication between your, your model and die technician uh, or, and or your communicator. Um, so whose responsibility is what? Well, let's take a look. Let's start with the model and die folks. We got to have these things thoroughly cleaned. The impressions. Uh, we don't know what kind of biocide is actually on that impression at this point, nor how many times uh, it's had this chemistry applied to it. So it needs to be cleaned. Uh, just a little model and die note there. If you're getting good clear pores the second time and fuzzy pores the first time, that's chemistry that's on your impression. You're not getting it clean enough. So it needs to be cleaned out. Um, now, you're going to check the impression for problem areas. A lot of our model and eye technicians don't know what they're looking for. So hopefully after this uh, bit of a course, you're going to know a little more about that. But uh, the, the uh, team that's there at the laboratory needs to be able to talk to your model and eye technicians and show them what to look for so that they can stop it. They, when they see problems, it needs to be called to the attention of the communicator before you pour the impression. We don't want to have bits and pieces of the impression destroyed uh, with model stone or die stone uh, prior to the time that you're able to communicate. Then the communicator needs to photograph and do emails, call it to the attention of the doctor, discuss solutions that are going to be viable, and then get authorization from the doctor and the authorization of his responsibility for proceeding with the case. Um, especially if it's against your better judgment as a laboratory technician. Now, ultimately, he's the one responsible for that case. But uh, before you proceed, it's always nice to have him understand what the problems are and then agree to move forward so that we stop the cycle of insanity. Uh, when that case doesn't work, 
then we've had this communication already, and the doctor knows uh, where that responsibility lies. It certainly didn't lie with you as a dental laboratory technician. So make sure you're doing this. Find out who these people are in your laboratory. You should know who they are, and make sure that you have that communication uh, between technician and communicator. All right, now. Uh, what we're going to take a look at today is uh, some samples of things and talk about them so that you can see them on the screen here. And uh, like Sarah had said previously, this will be up and available later on if you need to go back and review this course. So let's start with alginate. That's kind of a common impression material uh, that's being used right now, mostly for opposings, but uh, our removal folks get a lot of alginate impressions also. Alginate has its own kind of set of problems. So if we take a look, um, it's hard to, to actually photograph an alginate impression with problems. But let's take a look at what happens after we pour them up. This is some great, uh, some great things that go on. They're pretty common with alginate impressions. You can see this fold across the anterior teeth here. This was a distortion in the impression. And in fact, it even captured some alginate inside there. Uh, there was a tear. And you've got these little itty bitty bubbles that show up in, the, in these uh, impressions. Now that, unfortunately, is air trapped when the impression was poured. Uh, you can see them here. You can see little tiny bubbles down here on the bottom photograph. Uh, usually they'll show up right where you don't want them, on the inside the edges of things. That's something we need to work out in terms of technique uh, and what you're doing to compensate for the amount of moisture that's present in an alginate impression. Remember that thing is full of water, and then you're going to mix up your stone and pour it in there also with water. Okay? So um, what you need to do is to, to uh, make sure that your ratios are correct, and then you have somewhere to go. If you're just guessing at your water powder ratios, then you're going to have problems uh, in, in this area. So get back to them. Now, let's take a look at a couple of other things. Here's some bubbles that are poured up, and you need to recognize where these bubbles come from. So the first set you see constantly. See these little guys here? These things are air bubbles that were trapped in the impression, not by the pour. They're constant. You find them all over the occlusal surfaces coming back. Uh, it's just it's unfortunate it's part of an algin, uh, and we need to pop those things loose and get them out of the way. Um, then there are also bubbles that are caused uh, by other methods and means, OK? Here we are. These, at the bottom photo, these large bubbles like this. This is air entrapment that was caused by the person pouring the uh, impression. Uh, and they trapped air in their stump. And that's not good. We, we've got to work on technique to do that. Here's some little tiny bubbles underneath the distal end of that tooth. You can see those were trapped by the dentist or the assistant when they took the impression the first time around. Now, the other bubbles that we find are a little tougher to see. If you go to the bottom of the photograph, uh, you'll see some little tiny bubbles that are in the uh, stone material. Now, these are caused generally uh, by air entrapment uh, in the stone itself. This is uh, a stone that was mixed by hand in uh, flexible and uh, trapped all kinds of air in it. You shouldn't see that many of these uh, bubbles when you are uh, mixing with a vacuum mixing machine. And we always recommend doing that in the laboratory, no matter what you're doing. But if you're mixing by hand, you are incorporating air, no matter how good you are. Uh, the vibrator is not going to get rid of all that air that's been incorporated. And you don't want to turn it up onto mega vibrate. Uh, and assume that it's getting rid of it. It will get rid of quite a bit, uh, but it will not get rid of all of it. And in fact, you can have other problems, which we've discussed in uh, pouring model uh, webinars prior. Uh, so keep it down. The vibration should be as low as possible to pour what you need to pour. All right. Now, uh, some other things about alginate. Uh, Dr. Christensen in the uh, clinician's report in April of 2008 had some conclusions. Uh, alginate impression should be poured immediately for less than 30 minutes for best accuracy and detail, which means that, for the most part, your dental assistant should be pouring the alginate. Uh, you shouldn't be getting the call that says we have a pickup. You show up two hours later, and there's alginate wrapped up in paper towels. Uh, 
uh, you're already getting problems. So you need to have that discussion with your with your doctor's offices also. Uh, storage in a sealed bag uh, maintained accuracy up to 18 hours, but you'll notice that he said it was not a Ziploc bag. The sealed bag would be one of those uh, like seal a meal bags where it's actually heat sealed. Uh, that will keep it okay, uh, but the Ziploc bags will not do that. They will help. They will not keep it up to that kind of a uh, time frame. So. Uh, if you have pickup drivers that are on a run and they're picking it up and it runs in the car for another four or five hours, you're probably going to be in problems. Uh, wrapping impressions in moist paper towel was not as adequate as storage in a bag. Helped, but it was not as, act as adequate. So you need to remember those things. Pass that information on. This is uh, something that uh, has been done not just by uh, some old dental lab someplace, but by Dr. Christensen, Dr. Gordon Christensen. All right. Now, Let's, uh, let's move on to monophase or dual phase materials. That would be uh, PVS or VPS, which are basically the same thing. They just uh, kind of flip-flop depending upon the manufacturer. And polyether, that's probably, these, are, these materials are the most common that are used now for final impressions. Um, and they represent the biggest problem we have. Now, if, uh, if you're not familiar with this uh, troubleshooting guide by 3M, uh, you should give them a call, get copies of it. This is a great guide that will take you photographically through and show you some of the major problems that we have uh, on a day-to-day -day basis with impressions. It's, once again, not coming from the dental laboratory to correct the doctor, but it's coming from the company that manufactures the impression material. Uh, please get a hold of them. Uh, I'll have that information for you here in just a second. Um, this is just typical of uh, a page. It's great information. They talk here with photographs and uh, showing you what are the guidelines for a good impression. Now, I noticed that down in here, this is a little too small to use, so uh, here, here we are. We blew it up just a little bit. So these are the things that should be happening. They should have a uniform, homogeneous mix of materials. Most of these are part A, part B, and most of them are syringed, or they come out of some kind of a sausage pack. But they don't always get mixed right. They shouldn't be incorporating the first part of that tube of impression material. That should be squeezed through the tip and then removed. Uh, not all of them do that. The tray is sufficiently filled with impression material. We know that that uh, impression material is expensive. We've all heard that a million times. Uh, but if it's not sufficiently full, you're not going to get the kind of impression uh, that you need. So if you have a, an office that routinely uh, shortens that amount of material, and you need to have a discussion with them uh, through your communicator. Now, uh, thoroughly applied tray adhesive. Some offices are not painting adhesive, and that represents a problem later. Uh, they're relying on perforated trays to take care of that. Um, that kind of uh, anchor is nice, but it is not the total answer. They should be using tray adhesive. Uh, they should be using a rigid, sturdy impression tray. And many of the inexpensive plastic trays out there are not rigid enough. Uh, we see them all the time, but they do create problems because uh, they will distort as pressure is placed on them when they're full of impression material. And then once the impression is removed from the mouth, they have memory and they return back uh, to close to their original position. The impression material is not sufficiently hard to hold them out of the way. And what you get is a distorted impression when you pour. The expansion of your stone is not sufficient to push that impression back to where it should be. So we should be, on all of our final impressions, using rigid impression trays. Uh, there should be no voids or pulls on the margin detail. Uh, we see that all the time. We'll see photographs later. Uh, we should have detailed margins, no tears in the, mar in the impression materials uh, or rough surfaces. I know some of you will get tears and you super glue them back together, uh, and that's a great way to try and overcome a problem. But before you attempt to do any of that, your communicator should be communicating with the dentist uh, who took that impression to let him know that there is a problem. Uh, you should have no trace show through of the impression material. It should be a good blend between heavy body and light body materials. Uh, a strong bond between impression material and tray. 
no tooth contact with the tray, which would be any of what we call bite work. That changes what's going on with impression. This should be just a very static kind of a, uh, a place uh, that, that that impression material is in around those teeth while it's setting up. If we bit all the way through to the tray, then we know we have too much pressure going, and, uh, and now we have a distortion. And the last thing is complete information about the impression material used provided to the dental laboratory. Now, this is one of the things that, uh, that can pop up now and then. We, we see it generally when there's been a large meeting, say the Chicago Midwinter, or maybe down in Atlanta, and all of a sudden new types of impression materials are showing up at your laboratory. Uh, when that happens, be on guard because these are new impression materials for the staff, new impression materials for the doctor, and new impression materials for you. And if you have a rise in remix, it could simply be you're trying out something new and you just don't have a downfall yet. Um, so you need to know that. Uh, you need to also know in these materials if there is a uh, nitrogen scrubber in that material. If there is, it can be poured right away. If there's no nitrogen scrubber uh, in the PBS material, then it needs to sit out for at least two hours before you pour it, or you're going to wind up with little tiny nitrogen bubbles uh, inside your uh, impression, or excuse me, inside your dye stem. Um, so you need to know that information about the impression material. All right, now, um, this uh, is a typical cause and solution page that comes out of the guideline book. Uh, you'll see lots of this. This was poor bond of impression material to the tray. Uh, the way that uh, 3M has this set up is they give you a cause, and then they give you the solution, which is great. And you'll notice all of this, nothing, has to, nothing on here says anything about the dental laboratory is going to fix this. Uh, it's important that you understand that if you get a pull away, this impression material is already set. You cannot pull it back and stick it in place with super glue and make it work. You're, Maybe you're just exceptional, and you'll be close over the years. But you already have a distorted impression. It's not going to work. You can't push it back just with the expansion of your die stone and pulling it back against that tray just stretches the distortion. It doesn't return it to its original position. You need to know these things and be aware of them and call them to the attention of, of uh, the dentist. All right. So for uh, more information or copies of that troubleshooting guide, you can visit the 3M Corporation. There's the 800 number uh, and their website. And they're more than happy to send out copies of this. Uh, even sufficient, I think that they said that they'll send 75 copies uh, at, a, at a bunch for you. So uh, some of you larger laboratories, uh, there may not be sufficient. But at least it's a good way to get started with your communicator to make sure that the doctor has this material in his hand. Um, and they'll go over multiple, multiple problems in that little uh, troubleshooting guide. OK. Now, let's, uh, let's take a look at some problems, will you? Uh, just blast from the past. I don't know how many of you remember the little please stand by uh, picture that's up there. But, uh, for those of you who remember black and white television days, there we are. All right. Let's start right off. Now, some of these slides were given to us here by uh, Steve Killian. He's a great dental technician. Uh, took some terrific slides. We're going to show you the picture of the impression. And then we're going to show you what the model looks like when it's poured. Now, most of us would take a look. And hopefully, some of you are already seeing problems with this. But let's go through a few of them. You'll notice we have some pretty good uh, uh, representation here of all the burr marks uh, the doctor created here. The margin is close. Uh, I think we're going to probably see a decent margin on the four. Uh, we have a little bit of, of uh, problem uh, with the way that the impression material went down into the sulcus. Looks like we're having a little bit of saliva issue through there. Um, but the, there's a couple of other things that I want to point out here to you that you should be capturing. First of all, you can see we've got a tear over here, which means that when you pour this up somewhere in this uh, abutment tooth, we're going to have some problems. Now, that may or may not be an issue for you, but you need to be aware of it. Second of all, we've got these little kind of holes that appear uh, in the impression material here in the wash. 
But if you look over here, you can see them also uh, in this abutment tooth on the occlusal surface. So uh, it's something that we need to be aware of. Now, the other thing I wanted you to see was this granular look up here in this original material. Something went wrong with this mix. This should be nice and clean as it goes through, and it just isn't. Uh, if you cut into this impression material and you get this granular looking stuff, something's wrong with that original uh, heavy body material. And this should set off bells for you. All right, so let's take a look at what this looks like when we pour it out, just for fun. Now, I know that most of you have seen these before, and most of you have probably corrected them before. And some of you actually believe that you're really good at doing this because the doctor never sent them back to you after. But I will tell you that you're not that good. Uh, that margin in through this interproximal area was either too long when you corrected it, and the doctor had to reduce it, which means now it's too short in the patient's mouth, or, uh, and the doctor's relying on a, uh, on a cement margin interproximally, which is almost hilarious if you think about it. Because if you ask yourself where does most of adult decay take place, you recognize that it's interproximal, and we just set this patient up to have decay underneath a crown uh, that no one's ever going to see on any kind of radiograph. So we're, we're doubling up the patient problem. Now, we might escape as a lab, and the doctor might escape as a doctor, but two years, three years hence, uh, patients can lose this too, or at least significant portions of it. And, and we need to be mindful of that. Um, so here was a little leak. There was a little hole uh, that we saw, and it leaked, and it came all the way across the interproximal. It's actually wrapped itself clear around on this mesial uh, lingual corner here. Uh, some of us will pop that off, and every once in a while we'll get lucky, and we've got a little thin piece of impression material that's in between there, and we captured it. But for the most part, something like this is going to be a problem no matter what. Uh, we thought we had a pretty good margin up front, and what we actually wind up with is a margin that we probably are going to be able to scrape on and correct and maybe make it right. And you know, we'll send it out, and the doctor won't say anything to us, and we'll be happy because we escaped. But it's not the best dentistry. Uh, and we also have all these problems, of course, with the fluvial air trap and so we're in the impression itself that we're going to have to reduce. And if we reduce too much, then we wind up uh, with a crown that maybe is too low. If we don't reduce enough, we wind up with a clusal surface that we build on our uh, restoration that maybe is too high. So already problem. OK, that's just one. Now let's take a look at another one. Uh, this is uh, pretty common, classic. You can see this. Uh, air entrapment right at the marginal area. He's done it over several different areas. We just didn't get this uh, area dried out enough. Um, we still have that same kind of funny, garbly looking stuff as we go down into the sulcus with this impression. Probably you're going to get a pretty decent margin there, but what are we going to do here? Let's take a look at it when it's poured. All right, this is sort of classic. Uh, we actually see some pretty decent margin along here, but it has some other issues. Once again, as we head into that interproximal, that's where we seem to have these kinds of problems that we see. Uh, under the, the arrow. Now, this little one here also represents a problem for us. And we, the guys who are trimming dyes take care of these all day long. For the most part, they do a pretty good job. But they understand that if they over trim this, then we have a spot that's very weak um, and can, can cause porcelain fracture later on. Even in a PFM, because we're going to reduce the metal down to 3 tenths or less, especially in this. Uh, uh, anterior area up here, or excuse me, in this, in this buccal area so that we can get nice color. And uh, then we, we fire porcelain on that, and the metal moves just a little bit under the pressure of the porcelain. Doctor drops it on here, has the patient bite it in with an orange wood stick, and bang on. We get that nice thumbnail fracture of the ceramic. And it all stems from this little crazy thing that was a problem in the impression in the first place. So be careful with, uh, with what you're doing. Be careful with what you're doing. Uh, some of those other little holes in the impression turn up. You can see them over here, right on this central, where it's leaked through and left a big blob. That's the kind of stuff we've got to be, uh, be careful of also. Now, Steve is really good. He'll grab something like that, and he will uh, 
trim this thing out, mark it all up, make big red arrows, it's hard not to notice, and get it back to the doctor with the question of what do you want me to do with it? Um, you can see this is problematic, and we're going to have issues right here. Now, sometimes doctor says go ahead, and if that's the response, then that needs to be noted on the Rx, that the doctor uh, was the one who made the decision to move forward, and then if there's problems later, that once again uh, becomes the job of the communicator uh, to bring the doctor up on the phone and remind him that there were problems here which he authorized to, to move forward on. Um, so that you can institute some changes in how things are done. How things are done there at the uh, at the office. All right, now here's another great one. Uh, looks like the two materials uh, seem to work together well. Uh, doctor did a good job of capturing burr marks along here. It looks like we're probably going to get a decent margin. So what about that big old hole right there? Uh, this is one of those that you're going to worry about. Now, if you want to move forward with something like this. One of the corrections is to heat up some uh, box, boxing wax, ortho wax, something that's really dead soft, has no push or pull, and be able to just drop it into that hole and close that off. All this area is going to get trimmed away by your model trimmer anyway, your die trimmer. Uh, and if we close it and keep stone from flowing down underneath there, then we might be able to save this case. In either case, it should be uh, brought to the attention of the communicator, and the communicator brought to the attention of the doctor. Okay. Here's what it looks like when we pour it. Once again, it travels through that hole, and it wound up right here. You've seen this die uh, in a previous one, uh, but it does the same thing. It uh, leaves it all along that interproximal, and you're left to try to invent a margin. And we all know that as good dental technicians, we can invent anything, but it doesn't make it the best dentistry, and that's what we're really after. All right, another little one looks pretty good. Everything seems to be okay here. We do have that little bubble there that's on the marginal area again. Um, I'm a little concerned about whatever this is right here. Uh, most doctors don't create uh, protrusions and shells, especially on the buccal surfaces, facial surface of, of their stuff. So that might be something we want to take a look at. Then okay, let's see what it looks like when it comes out. Here it is. Okay, once again, one of those blobs. Now, a lot of us would just launch in and scrape that off, and that's fine. But what concerns me more is this ridge that's running right through here. Okay, I don't know too many dentists that when they prep a surface out here will lift up their burr and then go back at it again and leave that nice ridge. So what that ridge is really indicating is that we've got some kind of distortion in the impression. Um, this we can fix, but where's the distortion? Where is the difference? We know we have a break point, an angle point. Something's not exactly as it should be. And so it needs to be brought up to the attention of the doctor. Uh, once again, this, this uh, doctor is also trapping air. You can see it here and here and there and there, and of course over into here. So there's some, there's some, uh, a little bit of methodology that needs to change there at the doctor's office. Uh, he did uh, give you a nice area for a nice wide flat contact in that area, but uh, I, I'm not sure that overcomes the other things that are going on with impression. All right, now this one is actually one of my favorites. Uh, this thing looks pretty good, actually. If you take a look, now there's some areas I want you to kind of be concerned about. Now, Darren, around here, and we're always focused here, but this isn't all the story here with the prep is. It's also your abutment. What's going on? And if you take a look at this, it doesn't look like everything kind of got mushed in the way it should. It's granular looking. Maybe something's wrong there. And uh, let's see what happens if we go ahead and just pour this up. Here we are. Well, other than looking a little squat, the margins look pretty decent. I'm a little worried about this. We've seen this before. Uh, once again, most doctors don't grind in here and lift and then drop down the other side, so that could be problematic. But that's not even the big problem on this particular unit, uh, this particular impression. If you look over here to the side, you can see this that looks like it's been laid over the top of this tube, and it's happening on this side too. 
So we'll call that a double impression. And what that means is that somewhere somebody pushed and then backed off again. And that could very well mean that this is also important. So these kinds of things need to be noted. and They need to be brought to the attention of the doctor. Some doctors are going to say, you're bothering me by bringing this to my attention all the time. You need to know that about your doctor. If it bothers him that you're pointing out possible problems, maybe you've made it too easy to have them done. Take a look at some of them. All right. Now, some practical test cases. Uh, these are cases that do not have cord models, and what we're going to do is take a look at them. We, I want you to see what you see in these next slides. So I'll give you just a little bit of time, and I'll point out what I have to know that's going to represent a problem. But uh, you can talk amongst yourself real quick if you want, uh, and we'll take a look and see what you think. OK, here we go. Here's the first one. Nice uh, full arch, lower. All right, a little bit of dead air time there. OK, shall we launch into it? First of all, can you see how close the anteriors are to that tray? And there's probably some a little bit of show through right in here. So we banged into the anterior teeth with the tray, which very well could have dislodged what we were doing in the post here. But the other problem is, can you see the tray show through and where it is? Right by your margin. So I don't know that this is an accurate margin. Because as we press this little plastic tray down, it could have flexed this direction, and then as we pulled the impression, pulled back, and now you have a whole distorted area that's going to be here on the lingual side of the impression. So this is one that you'd have to pick up and discuss uh, through your communicator to the doctor. All right, now you kind of know what we're looking for. Let's take a look at this one. And what do you see? Uh, oh, I should tell you these are actual impressions. These were, uh, I sent a little email call out to a bunch of technicians to just take me photographs and send them back, and this is the kind of stuff that came back. All right. Well, first of all, remember that granular looking kind of material that was all over the place? It, it's sort of in there as it is. You can see here, we've got this bit that's sticking up and that bit that's going down and sort of a wash and sort of all these ridges that are going on. This material was not put together in a timely fashion, and uh, that's why we've got all of that going on. You can see trace show through, and guess where it is? It's almost always right there near the margin. And you can see almost two layers of material that seem to work through the margin. This thing is a distortion big time, and you really shouldn't be doing this case, not with this impression. I should go back to the top. All right, let's take a look at another one. A little bit blurry, but I love this. You just get them all the time. Um, if you didn't notice it right away and you were focused down here, the problem is over here. This is a this lower partial denture is completely unsupported. Now you may very well in your laboratory somehow take some alginate or something and support this around here and pour it and do all kinds of work to make it work. But it's not the best. This should have been a full arch impression to pick up that tray. Uh, just leaving it out here. You can make it work. You work at it to make it work. Doctor works at it to make it work. But it would have worked correctly had this been a full arch and supported. Okay? That's just that's really all there is to it. Now, there's other things wrong here, though, too. If you'll notice, this second material, the wash material, did not blend with the base material. You can see it's ridgy, which means that somehow this entire impression actually didn't get seated all the way down. We should have been able to seat that all the way down. It wasn't. So now we're going to not only have a problem with getting the partial seated like it should be, but we're going to have a problem with whether or not that crown actually seats in the mouth the way it should whether the occlusion's in the right spot, and then whether or not that partial actually fits on it where it should be fully down and on the tissue, and it's not going to do it. So you've got problems going on here the minute it walks in the door, and you need to communicate. All right, this is a great one. Um, we've got a lot of money already involved. We're going to do implants. We've uh, sold a patient on thousands of dollars worth of uh, 
uh, uh, work, and this is the impression that came out. Um, first of all, uh, we're missing some material, are we not? Um, and you can do your very best wax work in here, and it's probably not sufficient. Uh, the other thing is that you'll notice that these two materials didn't blend, and in fact, this uh, this darker purple material is actually pulling away from the original uh, uh, base impression. And so, even if it's even if it's done on wax, some guys will do that, which is not a great way to do things. Um, it's it's just not a good impression for all this work, and especially at this point, because you don't it, once these uh, once these uh, implants are in. You don't have any leeway. They are fixed in one spot. They're not going to move. They don't have periodontal ligament around them. allows them to travel a little bit. So you are dead in the water. This one needs to be done over, period. Okay? Don't even argue. It just needs to be done over. All right. Now, I know a lot of times that you'll hear, some of the, especially smaller labs will hear from the doctor. They'll say, well, my other lab can make it work. Um, that's probably true, and he's upset with them too, um, because when they try to make it work, it doesn't come out just right all the time either. Uh, this is a great impression that was done, plenty of space, a good rigid tray, the wash material blended well with the base material, and you can see that we're nowhere near the tray itself when it comes to our margins, and we wind up with beautiful impressions, and you all know this is where it begins with beautiful impressions. Now, uh, Dr. Christensen also has uh, some discussion about impressions. Uh, lots of folks have that. If you need to back yourself up with that kind of support, please do it. Uh, go online and find it. But here, here is one quote you might like. This is just from Dr. Kurtzman uh, over in Maryland uh, in an article that he did called Creating Great Dental Impressions. He simply said, accuracy in dental treatment starts with good impressions, and mistakes are amplified when errors are present in the impressions that dental offices provide the lab. You don't need to be responsible for those errors, but you do need to point them out. You need to communicate. Appropriate selection of both the impression material and the tray is the important step. Uh, you can find this uh, online if you want to see Dr. Kurtzman. All right, so there are some things to remember here. First of all, thoroughly clean and inspect that impression before you pour it up. Let's find the problems before you uh, push them into further problems with pouring diastone in there. Once you do, communicate the problems with the doctor. Use the telephone, digital photography, email, personal visits, whatever it takes to make sure your doctor understands that there is a problem coming with this impression. And lastly, record the instructions of the doctor concerning impression problems. Make sure that you know what the doctor said so that two weeks, three weeks from now, you can go back and have that conversation if you need to have it. It's never a good conversation, but it's an important one. We are all about doing good dentistry for the patient. And although our relationship is with the clinical side, we also know that ultimately it's about thousands of people out there that are walking around with our work in their mouth. It's got to be good. It can't be materials that are going to fall apart. So please, please communicate with your doctor. All right, that's the end of what we've got to say here, and uh, maybe there's some questions. Yeah, we're going to go ahead and open it up to questions right now. Uh, we do have one in, and uh, what is a nitrogen scrubber and impression material? Well. Early on, uh, the companies that were producing the polyvinyl siloxane and vinyl polysiloxane materials recognized that they did what was called outgassing. In other words, the, the chemical reaction that went on to uh, solidify part A, part B of that material created a nitrogen gas. And you've seen this before. If you want, uh, you can go to the gypsum presentations that we've done, and there are some photographs of it. These are uh, when you pour a model and you pull it out and you look and you have little tiny bubbles, indentation bubbles, not positive, but negative bubbles, little tiny ones. Uh, we call them champagne bubbles around here. Little tiny all over the surface. 
This is nitrogen gas that's trying to escape from the impression material and gets stuck, uh, pushes the stone out of the way while it's still wet, and creates that little bubble. Now, when the companies recognized that, they added a material that's called a nitrogen scrubber. And what it does is it captures the excess nitrogen chemically and binds it up so that it doesn't release like that. So uh, individual impression materials will tell you if they have a nitrogen scrubber or they don't have nitrogen. They won't say that they don't have them, but they will tell you if they do have them. Um, and so it's good to find out what impression material the doctor is using and then look it up on your own. Uh, get a package insert from the doctor, go online, see what you can find. Uh, but if it does not have a nitrogen scrubber, then it needs to just, that impression needs to bench set for at least two hours before you pour it. If it's got a nitrogen scrubber, then you can pour it up right away. Okay. Our next question is, what happens when there is a bite through on a triple tray? Will occlusion be off? Yes. How's that for an answer? <laughs> it absolutely will be off um, because the, the, uh, the tray, when that impression goes up in there around your teeth, that tray should be not, it should be compressed, of course. It has to be that to keep the material up there. But if, you, if you've got an assistant or a dentist who's pushing that tray up there, or, or you know, heaven help us all if the assistant has the patient to hold it, and I've been in positions where they've done that before. Um, you're, you're actually pushing now on one point that is solid, right, the tray, against something, which then will dislodge the remainder of the tray one direction or the other. It's like having a three-legged stool and only having one leg on the ground. Where do the others go? Well, they go wherever they kind of feel like going. And you just don't need that to happen. So if you've got bite through on a triple tray, somebody bit down too hard, probably you're going to have a problem. It's just something you ought to note and, and recognize and see up front and, uh, and do what you can to get around it. Now, as long as we're talking about that, let me, let me tell you this too. One of the other things, in most states it's illegal for the dental assistant, even with extended function, to take what are called the final impressions. But what does happen in the speed dentistry that's going on nowadays is Dr. Waltz is in, the assistant hands in the filled tray, he places the tray, and then there's a trade-off. Uh, doctor trades for dental assistant holding the tray. At that point in time, that's when a lot of distortions take place because two people don't have the same amount of pressure, even if they work together well, they just don't have the same amount of pressure. Sometimes there's a little movement of the tray at that point. Also, it's usually tray material starting to set, and so then we get pulls and we get all kinds of things on margin uh, and distortion. So it's, it, it all comes down to technique. Doctor really should be holding that until initial set is complete, and then he can trade it off if he needs to to go see the other patient. But a lot of time, that's where that's taking place. So watch the bite through. A lot of it is, uh, you know, we just trade it off and somebody pushes a little harder than somebody else. Okay, our next question is, what materials, in your opinion, is the best impression consistently for crown and bridge? Well, it's, I'll tell you, that's a, it's a hard question. The reason it's a hard question is because none of us use the same material the same way. So I like the, I like the PVS materials. The polyethers are fine. It just depends upon the user and who is actually taking that impression. Um, I have, uh, have old-time dentists uh, that, that I've talked with that are still taking uh, not only alginates, but uh, they're, uh, I just lost, the, huh, I just lost the, the name. I apologize. Um, but they're, they're taking colloidal uh, impressions. And those, the ones that required the old trays with the water running through them to solidify it, basically you were taking an impression with Jello. But they did fabulous jobs. The, the problem was, of course, there's only one pour on that thing. Um, I like the new materials. I really do. But you, you have to know how to work with them. Part of the problem is the way that they're sold. And if you ever go to the conventions and get around uh, 
not just the lab conventions, but the dental conventions, you'll find that a lot of these materials are sold, first of all, uh, ease of use. That will be the first thing. Uh, cost. That will be up there really high. You know, it's, its ability to work well, yeah, they all claim that. In fact, we have a lot of doctors that believe they only come from three places in the world anyway. Uh, and so they believe it's all the same, just like stone is just all the same. And so it depends upon the user and their ability to use that material. If they're having trouble using that material, then switch to a different material. It may be something that they find it's easier to use. Also, time frames are important. Uh, not all materials set at the same rate. And so just like you guys in the lab, if, if you're using a quick stone and you get 10 models to pour, you're going to have problems. Uh, if you're using a stone that sets a little longer and you've got 10 to pour, you're happier and more comfortable, you get a better pour done. Doctors the same way, if they've got something that's setting up in two to three minutes or it gives an initial set that rapidly, that might not be enough time uh, in the way that they do their dance from the point where the assistant mixes and gets it in the tray to the point they get it inside the patient's mouth. They may be having a, a trouble with that timing issue and need to go to a longer uh, setting material. So I know that's sort of an involved thing, but there's more to it than just really a yes or no. All right, we're going to wrap questions up with these the last two questions I have. Um, but before we do that, I just want to remind everybody that we will be sending out an email, which will have the information on it you will need to obtain your CE credit. Um, so you should be receiving that in about the next 24 hours. Um, so our last two questions, the first one is, how does the lab nicely emphasize to the doctor not to pass on holding the impression tray to the assistant before the impression time has set to prevent distortion? Well, one of the biggest things you have to do is go there with an example um, of what happens. And you can always, uh, you know, blame it on uh, Whitmix. You sat through this course and Whitmix and, and you know, if you need to, um, the, the problem is nicely, you're going to have to know your dentist. Some of the dentists are very open to communicating with you and recognize that you see things they don't see. Some of them are never going to recognize that you know anything. So um, you're going to have to simply uh, do it the best possible communication that you can do. Now, you may find that you have uh, somebody there at your laboratory who's actually a better communicator than the person you think should be doing the communicating right now. Sometimes the owner of the lab is not the best communicator. Uh, it depends upon the style of communication and the relationship with the dentist. So uh, the, the best thing is simply to get in with the dentist, sit down with him and say, you know, we've noticed over the, over the course of time here that we're having these issues and we want to find a way to resolve them for your benefit and the benefit of the patient. And we think it might be in this area. Okay? And that's when you can bring up this, the, the change, that switch, that handoff. Uh, and it does occur. If you make the dentist aware of it, uh, he can take a look at it and think about it the next time he makes that run through. And he may see it. He may actually see it in his, in his own practice. And he's just not aware of it because he's doing things rapidly and uh, you know, kind of uh, over and over and over again. We begin to lose uh, sight of specifics. So do that, but make sure you got someone who's really a good communicator. All right, what is the best impression material for full dentures? Do you recommend custom trays? Um, full dentures, I always recommend custom trays. Uh, it's, and maybe it's because that was my educational point, and we were doing, that's just what we did, was custom trays. But you know, denture patients are hard to fit a tray on, and anybody who's done that knows that. Um, you might very well also take a look. There is a new tray out. Uh, Dr. Massad has a new tray that actually you uh, warm up in, in uh, a Whitmix water bath, for example, and it becomes pliable. And so the, you put the tray in and you let the patient do some uh, sucking and movement, and the, the tray will actually form fit to the patient, and then pull it out when it's rigid and take the impression. Uh, we've had great impression materials on, uh, on uh, denture patients simply with alginate. Uh, once again, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of up to the, the uh, practitioner uh, to, to make sure they're using material that really works well. Now, I like using PBS just as well. Uh, Ampergum works great. Um, I would 
I would use whatever is best, but I absolutely would use a custom tray and not a stock tray. And please make sure you're not using one of the really inexpensive plastic trays that are out there on the market. There's just too much flexibility. Too much flexibility. You need a rigid tray. All right, and our final question is, how much does humidity in the doctor's office or lab affect the impression material? Well, it, the humidity itself isn't going to be too bad, actually. Now, it will affect the alginate, because remember, that's just purely a water mix. And uh, if they're not controlling humidity in their office or in your office uh, with, you know, even in the sealed up can, uh, you're going to start having problems with timing. Uh, the set time on alginate is going to run on you. Now, with PBS and pressure material, it doesn't matter that much. but always uh, you're going to come back to a humidity problem in anywhere, lab or clinical setting, you're going to have a problem with your dental stone. Uh, so uh, you, you should control your environment. You just flat should control your environment. Uh, find whatever it is, is necessary to get the humidity level down uh, somewhere around uh, you know, 68 perhaps and, uh, or lower if possible. And, uh, and, and you should just control it all the time. It, it makes for better everything. Everybody in there is more comfortable. The materials, all the chemistry works better. Um, I, would, I would do my very best to, to make sure we're not uh, uh, pound wise and penny foolish or dollar wise and penny foolish as they used to say. Uh, saving a few cents, but we're, our environment's out of control. I've talked about this before with investing and with, with model stones. You guys are doing chemistry all day long, and you can't control your chemistry if you can't control your environment. So this is the impression material is chemistry again. Uh, we should be controlling our environments just to help our own selves out uh, with all of that. So hope that answers the question. And uh, if you have more, of course, uh, Cheryl will give you the contact. We, we're always happy to answer any questions we can here at Whitney. All right. Well, that's um, go. That concludes our webinar today, and I want to thank everybody for joining us and. Have a wonderful day.